everyone, and welcome to Uncivil Law. For today's case, we have a decision dealing with who has the authority to act for the United States government and who has the right to be appointed to certain positions within the government. This is the case of LMM versus Ken Cuccinelli in his purported official capacity as acting director of United States Citizenship and Immigration Services. So the fact that we have the word purported in there tells us we are up for some exciting stuff. In this case, Ken Cuccinelli was appointed to be the acting head of citizenship and immigration services, perhaps in an improper way. And he's been doing things, perhaps without authority, including publishing memorandums that significantly change how immigration is being done. So some people who are immigrants are suing because of deprivation of rights. They argue that Ken Cuccinelli didn't have the right to put in these restrictions in the first place because he wasn't properly appointed. Let's get started with this. Under the appointment clause of Article 2 of the Constitution, the President must obtain the advice and consent of the Senate before appointing any principal officer of the United States and, unless Congress vests the appointment power in the President, a court or department head alone, before appointing any inferior officer as well. So that was a lot of language there in terms of what that stuff means and what it doesn't mean. So some of the, a lot of the stuff has been fought over for a lot of time, and there's still a lot of issues dealing with these issues. Like who counts as an officer and who doesn't, right? So we, we, we generally know that principal officer means like the secretary of fill in the blank. Secretary of Homeland Security, Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense, right? That's a principal officer. Right. And then we have other positions which may or may not be principal officers and other positions which are may or may not be inferior officers. And then we have the federal bureaucracy as a whole. And no, and most of the time they're treated as employees, not as officers, although you could make a reasonable case that even the lowest level bureaucrat is an officer within the meaning of the Constitution. Now, that's a little bit esoteric for our purposes, but the point is that like who who has the authority to do what and when is a little bit of a question. But we do know if it is a principal officer, whatever that means, the president has to do it. If it's an inferior officer, then either the president or the principal officer can do it. So that's where we are. This requirement is more than a matter of etiquette or protocol, is among the significant structural safeguards of the constitutional scheme. So this is dealing with balance of powers, right? Who has the authority to do what and when? And one of the restrictions here is that you have to get confirmation from the Senate for certain positions within the federal government, within the executive, right? So we have all those wonderful confirmation hearings. And what they're saying here is like, this is more than just like a matter of etiquette. This is a matter of constitutional structure. It's a matter of checks and balances, right? Only the president can nominate somebody and only the Senate can confirm them. And when they're confirmed, they, that comes with certain powers and certain authority to do certain stuff. And it's part of the latitude. like. You know, maybe we don't really care that much if we're appointing, you know, an entry level bureaucrat, but we probably care quite a lot if we're appointing like the Secretary of Homeland Security, probably kind of important. So this is part of this balance. It's not just a courtesy. It, it actually matters as part of the balance of powers is struck out in the Constitution. The constitutional process of presidential appointment and Senate confirmation, however, can take time. It sure can as we all learned from the Merrick Garland situation, including like one of the branches just not doing something. And like, lest I miss the point completely, because this is one of the things about the whole Merrick Garland thing that kind of a little bit irritates me and part of the discussion of it, right? So like the left will give the Senate flack because they say, well, you have a constitutional duty to give advice and consent and you just didn't do it. Right. So this is one of the arguments of like why they got really upset about the whole Mark Garland situation. It's like you have a duty, an obligation to give advice and consent. You can't just say like we're not going to. But if that holds for the Senate, then it equally holds for the president. Right. Because the president would have the same the same obligation to nominate. Right. And that was one of the things you heard, like the president has the, the obligation to nominate. But of course, the president just doesn't have the obligation to nominate for the Supreme Court. He, is, he would have the obligation to nominate for every position that has Senate confirmation, which is quite a lot of them. And I know that there are quite a lot of open positions within the federal government at the time that Merrick Garland was being appointed to the Supreme Court that were open and had remained open for quite a while. For example, at the time, the head of ATF, what, there wasn't one. 
and the position had been open for quite a while. And the president had indicated that, as I recall, and I might be going misquoting because I'm going back a little while now, but I, I seem to recall that President Obama said that he had no intention of making an appointment. So if the Senate was in dereliction of its constitutional duty for not making the confirmation, which incidentally, I don't think they were, like they can just not do things, I think is an option. Then the president would have to be in dereliction of his constitutional constitutional duty for not making many, many appointments that were open. So, you know, but this is part of a process. There's a confirmation process. It takes time. You know, it doesn't it doesn't necessarily have to take time. I mean, the Senate can do whatever it likes. The Senate could have just some process that says we're just going to rubber stamp all these things. But of course, no one likes to give up power. So the Senate, you know, takes its sweet, sweet time and sometimes to the point of not doing it. And the president sometimes takes his sweet time to the point of not doing it. So it is the point. It is part of the constitutional balance. These delays raise the prospect that duties and functions assigned to an office requiring presidential appointment and Senate confirmation, referred to as a pass office, horrible name, can go unperformed. Congress has, since the early days of the Republic, authorized the president to direct certain officials to temporarily carry out duties of vacant offices and in acting capacity without Senate confirmation. So, you know, some of these positions require Senate confirmation, but at the same time, it's like, it'll take a long time. So, okay, we, we've created basic, basic rules. We've created basically rules dealing with um, you know, when a position becomes vacant, who gets to act in that capacity? So you'll see like acting secretary and whatever, acting undersecretary, acting deputy secretary, because a lot of times they're just like, you know, just named in, in their positions right now. Like some of the cabinet officials are acting because they have not been formally nominated and formally proposed. So this is something that, you know, allows for this to happen. Yes. The Federal Vacancies Reform Act of 1998 represents the latest version of this authorization. Subject to exceptions that are not relevant here, it sets forth exclusive means of temporarily filling vacancies in these offices. The default rule under the statute is that the first assistant to the vacant office automatically serves as an acting official when the vacancy arrives. That default rule applies unless the president, and only the president, directs that a person who has been confirmed by the Senate to serve under another PAS office or an employee or officer of the agency in question who has worked for that agency in a senior position for at least 90 of the last 365 days preceding the vacancy perform the functions and duties of the office temporarily in an acting capacity. So there are some default rules here in terms of like who can provide what services. And one of the rules is that like if you are in a confirmed position, you can be asked to lead any other confirmed position, including in a different branch or a different thing, which is kind of a little neat trick that a lot of people don't know about. So if you're a Senate confirmed position and say, I don't know, the Secretary of State's office and they need someone in Homeland Security, they can like transfer you over and you can become the acting head of Homeland Security because you're a Senate confirmed position. So you can move these people around, which is kind of a cool little neat trick that people don't know about. And there's also another uh, provision that says there's the senior effect, senior executive officials within the agencies, these career officials, right? And one of them says, well, as long as they've been there 90 days of the last year, then you can say that this person is the acting head. So there's like a default rule that says like in the absence of any directive to the contrary, if this person resigns, this person gets an authority. If this person resigns, this person gets authority, right? But then it also says that the president can direct something else. Because, you know, he's head of the executive branch. So it makes sense. So, like, there's a d default rule that says, in the absence of this, of this, we'll do this. But the president can say, no, I want to move these people around. So we give, them, we give both sides flexibility. The relevant events begin here on June the 1st, 2019, when Lee Francis Cicina, the Senate-confirmed director of immigration, resigned. And as the statute prescribes, his first assistant, the deputy director, Mark Kumas also automatically assumed the post of acting director. Fine. The director of immigration resigned. His first assistant comes into place. This is normal, right? But that's where things get interesting. Kumar's tenure, tenure, however, was short-lived. Nine days after the, the director resigned, the then, act, the then serving acting secretary of Department of Homeland Security, so himself acting, Kevin McAllen appointed Cuccinelli to serve as principal deputy director. 
a position that did not exist prior to Cuccinelli's appointment. So the, the Secretary of Homeland Security, which governs immigration, you know, sent out a memo that said, okay, I'm going to try to amend this default rule. I'm going to appoint a person into a position that incidentally doesn't exist. And I'm going to say it's the first position. And the person I'm going to appoint is Ken Cuccinelli. Okay, fair enough. For those of you who are not as familiar with politics as others, Ken Cuccinelli is, let's say, a controversial figure um, at best. Uh, he's, a, he's, a, he's a very conservative person. Um, and, you know, he, he, he definitely has his critics. Um, so it, it is not surprising that the Trump administration would appoint him. It's also not surprising that it would be a controversial appointment. But yeah. The same day, the acting secretary also revised the order of succession, designating the newly created position of principal deputy director as the first assistant and most senior successor. So like, I'm just amending all the rules. These two changes, both of which occurred after the vacancy arose, allowed Cuccinelli to leave Frank Kumos to become the act acting director. So we have this person in place. They become the acting director. The director, the, the Secretary of Homeland Security says, no, I'm going to create an entirely different position. I'm going to put someone into that position. I'm going to say it outranks you. And now they've, they, but they are now the first acting assistant. So, okay, that's, that's something that was tried to be done. On July the 2nd, 2019, three weeks after assuming office, Cuccinelli issued a memorandum announcing a revised policy for scheduling a credible fear interview in an expedited removal proceeding. Okay, so we're talking about people who have credible fear. We're talking about asylum seekers, right? So to get asylum, you have to have some sort of credible fear of, you know, you know, retribution or otherwise. So we're talking about asylum in an expedited removal context. So these people who are under expedited removal, but they're claiming asylum. So how are we going to do these interviews? Okay, that's what we want to modify. Under the revised policy, immigration services reduced the time allotted for asylum seekers to consult with others prior to the interview from 72 or 48 hours to one full calendar day from the date of arrival at the detention facility. So one of the things that we're reducing is the amount of time that you have to consult with someone. So, like, you have the ability to consult with someone, but we were giving you 72 hours. We were giving you 48 hours. Now we're giving you 24 hours. One calendar day. So, like, yeah, you better consult with someone rapidly, which I guess kind of makes sense in an expedited context. You know, and it was already pretty expedited. We went from three days to one day. So, okay, that's a thing that happened. And it prohibited asylum officers from granting asylum seekers extension of time to prepare for the interviews, except in the most extraordinary of circumstances. So one of the things you might be able to do is give someone a waiver or give them an extension and basically said, no, don't do these. Don't do these extensions anymore unless there's like a really, really, really good reason. So we're trying to make it, you know, we're trying to constrain the time. So we're saying don't do three days anymore. Do one day. That's the amount of time they have and don't give them an extension. Okay. The plaintiffs, five individual native Honduran asylum seekers, two adults and three of their minor children, and the Refugee, Intermigrant, and Center for Education and Legal Services, a nonprofit organization that provides legal services to refugees, challenges the lawfulness of the asylum directive. First, they allege that Cuccinelli was not lawfully appointed to serve as director or acting director, and that, as a result, the asylum directives must be set aside under the apportion clause. So they're arguing this person didn't have authority at all, therefore they're not valid directives, therefore they must be set aside. Fine. On the merits, the court concludes that Cuccinelli was not lawfully appointed to serve as acting director and that, as a result, he lacked authority to issue the reduced time to consult and prohibition on executive directives. The remedy for that deficiency, moreover, is compelled by the law. The asylum directives must be set aside because they are made without power. Finally, having reached the conclusion, the court does not and does not reach the alternative legal challenges. Fine. Although we've talked about it a little bit earlier, let's talk a little bit more about the details of these asylum directives that were issued, because the court goes into a little bit more detail about it. So let's read what the court has to say. On July the 2nd, 2019, Cuccinelli sent the Acting Secretary of Homeland Security a memorandum notifying him that, effective as of July the 8th, six days after the fact, or six days later, they, the immigration is reducing the credible fear consultation period to one day from the date of arrival at a detention facility and will deny requests for extension as unreasonable delaying a process except in the most extraordinary of circumstances. The memorandum explained that Immigration and Nationalization Act provides asylum speakers in a credible fear process the right to consult with persons of their choosing as long as the consultation is at no expense to the government and does not unreasonably delay the process. 
under pre-existing policy, those held at a family residential center were given 72 hours after arrival at the facility and reorientation by immigration to seek and receive consultation. And other detention facilities, single adults were generally not interviewed until 48 hours after the facility in order to seek consultation. So families were given 72 hours, single adults were given 48 hours. This was the rule before. Okay. According to the memorandum, Cuccinelli decided to reduce the time for the credible fear consultation period and to limit the availability of extensions to only the most extraordinary circumstances for two reasons. First, he explained immigration had completed revisions to its form and gives that form to detainees upon their arrival at the detention facility to comply with statutory and regulatory obligations to provide asylum teachers subject to expedited removal with information concerning the, re re the interview. So it's, it's, it's okay because we've given you a form. That explains everything. Okay. By using plain language principles in order to provide greater clarity to the alien during the consultation process, the Cuccinelli explained the revised form makes the credible fear process easier for aliens to understand and thus justifies shortened consultation period. Oh, yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not, not 100% slow on that, you know, because like, Informing the person is one thing, but like their ability to consult is still another thing. So like the, the ability to meet with someone and consult with someone is a thing unto itself. And so like within 24 hours, you have to find an attorney and consult with them. I mean, that's, that's a tight time schedule, you know? So I'm not sure all the forms in the world really help with that problem, but okay. Second, the memorandum asserted without elaboration, the policy shifts were justified because immigration must do its part to ensure the processing aliens is not unduly delayed in light of the situation on the southwest border. You know, I'm, I'm a little unclear how much undue delay was being had by the old rule. You know, the old rule was 72 hours or 48 hours. Like, I mean, on the one hand, I, it would be an issue of how many people are coming through, but it seems like... That's pretty expedited, not an unreasonable delay. Um, but, you know, that's what Cuccinelli said. So, OK. On July the 8th, 2019, the Immigration Services updated its credible fear procedural manual to reflect the policy changes announced in the memorandum. The update manual notes it's now the policy of the asylum program to allow a minimum of one full character day to transpire between the arrival of the detention facility or receipt of the initial form, whichever is later, and any credible fear interview. With the issue properly highlighted by the courts, we now, now must get into the merits of the issue, whether or not there was authority for Ken Cuccinelli to issue these directives. So let's get into the merits discussion. Mosaic Task Force asks the term alien. Yeah, the, the term alien is the term that has been used, at least in U.S. immigration law, forever, and person who is not a citizen or otherwise a natural resident of the United States. So you're either a citizen or a permit resident, or a lawful resident, or you're an alien, you're not within the jurisdiction of the United States. So yes, aliens need not be extraterritorial or extraterrestrial. So yes, we have two different kinds of aliens. Extraterrestrial, which comes outside the outside of terrestria, you know, outside the Earth, uh, outside of Terra, right? The Earth, extraterrestrial, for Terra, for the Earth, so outside of Earth, and then extraterritorial, outside the United States. So yes, two different kinds of aliens, but one of them definitely exists, yes. The plaintiffs challenged the asylum directives on a variety of grounds, several of which carry considerable force. The court need only reach one of the grounds because it's sufficient to resolve. You know, courts do look for the least, the easiest path to. So if there is a way to resolve the case and it's the easiest way, it's the way the court is going to do it. But yeah. That challenge asserts the asylum directives were issued by Cuccinelli in his capacity as acting director, that Cuccinelli was not lawfully appointed to this position and thus lacked the authority. Pretty simple argument, right? Accordingly, the directives are without valid effect. As explained below, the court agrees and will set aside the reduced time to consult and prohibition on extension directives because they were not valid. The current iteration of the Vacancies Act follows the structure that provides that a vacancy in a confirmed office can be filled in one of three ways. First, absent action by the president, the first assistant to the office of such officer who has died, resigned, or otherwise unavailable shall perform the functions and duties of the office in acting capacity. Fine. Secondly, the president and only the president may direct a person who serves in an office for which appointment is required to be made by the president by and with consult Congress to perform the functions of the vacant office again subject to limitations. So we can move people around. 
Third, the president and only the president may direct an officer or employee of the agency experiencing the vacancy to perform the functions and duties of the vacant office, but only if the individual served in a senior position in that agency for at least 90 days before the occurrence of the vacancy. Fine. The parties agree that the question of whether Cuccinelli was lawfully appointed to serve as acting director is answered one way or another by the statute. Within the framework, the parties focus their arguments on the question as to whether, as plaintiffs contend, the first assistant default rule applies only to individuals serving as first assistants at the time of vacancy, or as defendants contend, the default rule also applies to individuals first appointed to the position after the vacancy arises. Now is not the time to resolve that question because Cuccinelli's appointment fails to comply with the statute for a more fundamental and clear-cut reason. He never did and never will serve in a subordinate role, that is, as an assistant to any other official. For that reason alone, the contention that the appointment satisfies cannot be squared with the text or purpose of the law. So the problem here is that he never served in any sort of subordinate role at any point. He was he was he was he was appointed to a position that was created just for him. So like he wasn't like even like that the deputy position itself was open and that he was appointed to that position, which will kind of make sense. Right. Because then like. Even though you didn't serve in a, even though your boss doesn't exist, and even though you're just coming in, like if you're validly appointed to that position, right? In principle, you would you would serve the 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 person above, who doesn't exist at the moment, but in principle you would, right? But that situation isn't here. We created an entirely new position just for you, so like you know you never served as a deputy, and this position never served as a deputy. And you never will serve as a deputy, right? So, like, it's not like there's any contemplation that you will ever serve as a deputy. The whole thing is one massive legal fiction, in other words, the court is saying. And so, like, it doesn't comply with the statute. Um, so that's, you know, a thing that this court said. Historical practice can, at times, aid in defining phrases that Congress has used and reused in a series of statutory enactments. Nothing in the historical record of the Vacancies Act, however, counsels in favor of construing the phrase first assistant to include those who hold the title of first assistant, but occupy an office that is, in actuality, was not, is not, and never will be subordinate. So, yeah, just because we gave you a title, like, it doesn't actually do this in reality, right? So it wasn't that you were appointed to a position that exists. You a position was created for you, but it does not, never will serve as a subordinate role. So the whole thing doesn't quite make sense. Doesn't square with the statute. Okay. The structure and purpose of the law further confirmed Cuccinelli was not lawfully designated to serve as the acting director. For all these reasons, the court concludes that Cuccinelli was designated to serve as the acting director of immigration in violation of the law. So that is the end of our coverage of this case of LMM versus Ken Cuccinelli. In this case, we learned that Ken Cuccinelli was attempted to be appointed in a position that didn't exist in order to make help him leapfrog in order to be the director of the immigration services. Um, this was not the end for Ken Cuccinelli because he has since been appointed to be the acting deputy secretary of Homeland Security. And as a result of that has created a created a, this weird little position where he's performing the roles of the head of immigration services rather than in the acting capacity, which is a wonderful legal technical distinction. Not the first time this has been done. I know it was done under the Obama's uh, Obama as well, where they did the same trick, but here's now what they've done, right? They've, they've uh, nominated him and appointed him to be the deputy secretary of Homeland security. The head of immigration serves the 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 position of the acting head of homeland, the deputy secretary. And so basically what he's done is says, well, uh, I'm going to designate someone to serve this position, not as acting, but basically as a proxy for me, which is also me. So he is currently the head of immigration services, in addition to being the deputy secretary of Homeland Security, basically having appointed himself without doing so because he's delegated authority to himself as the person who reports to himself in order to get around all this problem. And that, as far as we're aware, is legal. I and You know, the, the law on appointments can get really, really weird, right? Because the position of deputy secretary of Homeland Security did, ex did exist, right? So he's appointed into that position. 
lawfully. He has now delegated authority that he had because the head of immigration reports to him. He has delegated the authority to himself to act in the position in order to report to himself, but he's not acting in that capacity. He's just de facto head. So, yeah, the, 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 the Ken Cuccinelli situation has not ended. He remains in the U.S. government as acting, head, acting deputy secretary of Homeland Security. He got a promotion. He got a promotion. He's now the deputy secretary of Homeland Security, and he remains head of immigration, having, a, having delegated authority to himself. And that is the end of the coverage for the moment of this case. Thank you so much for being part of the Uncivil Law family. I appreciate your continued support. If you haven't already done so, please subscribe to the channel and you can also support us financially by clicking the applaud button below. Thank you so much for your contributions to our channel. It helps our work grow. Until later, cheers and goodbye.